Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem range sum of sorted subarray sums. So the idea is we're given an array of numbers as you can see here. It's sorted here, but it's actually not necessarily going to be sorted. I think that can be something that you might be confused about just kind of the way this is worded. But the idea is that if we want to get all of the subarrays from here, well, we would have n subarrays starting at the first element and we'd have n minus one subarrays starting at the second element. And it would kind of go like that. So you can think of it as having four subarrays plus three subarrays plus two plus one. So it's proportional to n squared. It's actually roughly n squared divided by two. They give you the actual formula over here, but you can kind of like conceptually think of that as like half of a square, but that's not super important. All we need to know is that we can get the sum of every single subarray and it'll be an array roughly n squared in length. And from that array, we want the sum of a subarray from a left index up until a right index. And these are parameters that are actually given to us. And so the sum of that could be really big. So they want us to mod it by this big prime number. The obvious way to solve this problem is just to build this array. Actually, I guess one thing we didn't mention is that this array itself should be in sorted order. It's not super difficult to do that. Just kind of build it, just get every single subarray add it to an array and then sort it after the fact and then just get the sum of this portion of the array. If we don't want to overflow it, we'll have to add numbers one by one, modding it by that prime number every single time. And that's pretty much it. Now, just one thing to keep in mind, I actually missed this, is that these indices left and right are one indexed, meaning that left doesn't actually correspond to index left. It will correspond to index left plus one. Same thing with right. It'll actually correspond to index right plus one. This approach is relatively straightforward, I think. And I think that's why this is a medium problem, because the next solution I'm going to show you is not going to be much more efficient, but it's much, much more complicated. And I don't think it's personally a medium solution, but uh, the time complexity of this approach is going to be first building this array is going to be n squared and then sorting that array is going to be n squared log n squared. The term in here like that too is pretty much distributed out here the way logarithms work. So we can actually get rid of that constant. So you can see here the bottleneck is going to be this. So we can say that that is the overall time complexity. Since we are actually building this array, the space complexity is going to be n squared. Let's code this one up. We're going to first build that array and I'll call it subarray. I guess I could call it subarray sums. And I guess I'll do that just to be a bit more descriptive because this is going to be a pretty short solution. So to get every subarray, we're going to do kind of the two pointer method nested loops. So I in range and they actually give us the length of the input with this parameter. I don't know why they did that. I would have rather just not had this parameter and had these left and right actually be what they are supposed to be like the actual indices but we could do that if we wanted to we could set left equal well we could decrement it by one and then we could decrement right by one and then these would actually mean like the indices from left to right but i guess i won't do that though it probably would make things a bit more readable so here i'm going to say for i in range the length of that which is n so let's just do that and then for j in range starting at i going until the end of the array we want to keep track of the subarray sum going from i to j so i'm going to initialize a variable i'll call it current sum initially it'll be zero and every single time we get to an integer at index j we are going to add that number to the current sum. I guess this could also technically overflow. So I guess I'll go ahead and create a variable mod and this will be that prime number that they were talking about. 10 to the power of nine plus seven. And so here to increment this, we'll say current sum plus the number at J and then I'll mod this by that number. And every single time we have a subarray sum, let's just append it to these subarray sums that we have just like that. And now second phase, let's sort these subarray sums just like this. They're gonna be sorted in ascending order. And now to actually compute the sum from the subarray sums from left up until right. But remember, these are not the actual indices. But either way, we're not going to do this. We can't just sum this. I mean, in Python, you could probably get away with doing this and then modding it after the fact. But in most languages, you can't. You'll have to do it one by one. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to initially declare a result to be zero. I'm going to go for i in range. Normally, we'd say left to right. 
well, probably left to right plus one if they were the actual indices, but we wanna do a minus one on both of these. So here I'll say left minus one, and here rather than doing a minus one, I'll just get rid of the plus one. So there you go. And to the result, we want to constantly increment it, but to do that, like with the mod, we'll do it like this, result plus the value in subarray sums at index i, and then after that, mod it by the mod go ahead and just return the result. Now you can see the solution actually does work. It's relatively efficient. And I'll show you another solution, the second solution. It won't actually improve the time complexity. I mean, in the worst case, it'll still be the same as this one, which is n squared log n, but the space complexity will be reduced from n squared down to O of n. But honestly, the solution is so much more complicated that that kind of small improvement might not be worth it but it's still a relatively short solution, which is why I'm gonna show it to you. I guess I'll start with the intuition rather than just jumping straight into the solution. Remember what we're ultimately trying to do. We have these values in sorted order. Instead of having them all in memory at one point in time, which would occupy n squared space, is there a way we could possibly go through them in order? Like have some kind of pointer for i at the first one, okay, I'm here. And then I'm here, and then I'm here, and then I'm here. And eventually we know that when our I pointer gets to the left pointer, okay, this is the value we actually care about and we wanna add it to the result. And we do the same thing and same thing here. So we collect everything in this. And then by the time we get to the right pointer, we're done, right? So we would have skipped all the values before the left pointer, but all these values we would have collected into the result. Is there a way we could possibly do that? Well, the answer is yes. And I'm not just gonna tell you how to do it because there is some intuition in coming up with the solution. That's what I wanna start with. First of all, what would the minimum value possibly be? Keep in mind that everything in the input is positive. All of these are gonna be positive numbers. So now you tell me, what would be the smallest value here? Well, it's not gonna be an actual subarray that's not of size one. It's gonna be the minimum of all of these elements. That's the smallest possible element. So in this case, it happens to be one. One is the smallest. Okay, now what would the second smallest element be? This is the harder question to answer. You might think, well, it's just gonna be the second smallest from the input, not necessarily. I mean, in this example, it kind of is, but consider a different example. Okay, I guess I was wrong, even in this example. So the first smallest would be one, and the second smallest actually would also be the second smallest element remaining from the rest of them, right? It would be two. It couldn't possibly be both of these added together because they're both positive. So the two smallest values added together will never be smaller than each of the values individually. So I guess that question was easy to answer as well. But this third question, is not gonna be easy, I'll tell you that much. Now that we've gotten rid of these, what would the third smallest possible value be? In this example, it's not gonna be six, it's not gonna be seven, and it's not gonna be eight. So what could it possibly be? It's We can't do these, we've already gone through them. Well, it's gonna be subarrays that include these numbers. And how are we gonna get those subarrays? This is kind of the tricky part. When we calculate subarrays initially, we're kind of doing it like this. And that's the same idea we're gonna do. Every time we have a value here, we're gonna get all subarrays that include this, and that's gonna look like that. With this, we want all subarrays like that. So the solution, now that I've given you a bit of the intuition, is that we're gonna have a data structure called a min heap, because from the initial set of elements, we want the minimum value. So a minimum heap is gonna allow us to do that. But every time we pop a value, Value. we're not just getting rid of it we're actually going to replace it with the same value plus the right neighbor so initially our heap looks like this we pop that and then our heap is going to have this plus its right neighbor so it's going to have three added to it and this is gone then we pop two we will replace it with this plus its right neighbor. The reason we're doing the right neighbor is the same reason we do it with the nested for loops because we don't want duplicates. We wouldn't get the left neighbor here and then for this guy get the right neighbor. So we will replace this with two plus six. Notice how if there is a subarray sum that is smaller than like an individual number, we will get it first because we're popping the values that are minimal. 
And with this, we can't just jump a spot. Like we can't just take this element and then add like an element over here because then it's not a contiguous subarray, which is why every time we take that element plus its right neighbor and then add that to the heap. Next, we're going to pop this one, this three. So that will be the third number that we pop. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. When we have these elements and we add them to the heap, we're not just going to add the number itself. We're also going to add the index and the index is actually going to be changing. So when we had the initial values on the heap, we would have added the initial indexes for each element. But when we took one plus two, that was three, and we added that to the heap, we would have then given it an index of i, which here was zero, plus one, because we're saying that that subarray sum ended at this index, index one. So now when we pop three, we'll get the value, and then the next number that we will push and replace this guy with is going to be the number to the right of it. So that three represented this subarray sum. So now we want it to represent this subarray sum. So we're going to take our pointer, whatever you want to call it, I or J or something, and we're going to slide it to the right and add this number to it. So now it's going to be three plus six. So that will be nine over here. I think that's more or less the intuition. Again, once we got into the like element that's at this index or we popped like that many times, and we're actually part of the solution set. We're going to take those numbers and add them to the result. I think that will probably make more sense in the code. Now, there is one question you might be wondering, how could you possibly come up with this solution? Well, I hope I give you at least a tiny bit of the intuition. But again, this is insanely difficult to come up with. Don't ask me how to come up with it. I think that's a question for God, to be honest. You can definitely see that the space complexity is not going to be n squared. It's actually going to be big O of n, because remember, these values that we're popping, we're not actually adding them to an array. We're only going to be pushing and popping from the heap. The heap will never be larger than size n. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to initialize a min heap. I'm going to use list comprehension. So I'm going to do I N in enumerate nums. And so this tuple, remember, we want like a pair of values on the heap and it's going to represent the number and I. The reason I'm putting them in this order is because N is going to be what is actually going to be used to sort this. If you want to learn more about like all the syntax and stuff, I think my Python for coding interviews course should cover it. Right now, this is just an array. We want to turn it into a heap and we can do that in Python like this, heap q, heapify, the min heap. Now we want to start popping from the heap, but we want to keep track of how many elements we've popped. So I'm just going to use a pointer called i for that. And we're going to do for i in range up until right. Remember, this index does not actually represent the real index. So like if right was, let's say 10, that would mean we want to stop when we get to index nine, which is exactly what this does in Python, because this will be non-inclusive. We'll stop at one minus this. So then we want to do this heap Q heap pop from the min heap, and we're going to get a pair of values. I'm going to call it the num and I'm going to call it the index, not to be confused with this I over here. If anything, I should probably change this to count, but I don't know if that's better. I really don't like you can change these variables the way to make sense for you, but don't get these two confused. That's a really easy mistake to make. This is the index that this subarray ended at. This is the number of elements that we've popped. So now first we want to have a variable for the result, which initially is going to be zero. And that is what we're going to be returning. But we will only want to add to the result if this number is within the range from left to right. So we would do something like this if I is greater than or equal to left. But remember that left is one index. So we actually want left minus one. And here we're going to then add to the result like this um, result is going to be result plus the number and make sure to mod it. We have that. The last thing is we want to then push back to the heap. So we can do that with heap Q dot heap push to the min heap. But what we want to push, I'm going to call it the next pair or the next subarray sum or whatever you want to call it. But it's going to be a pair. And the first thing is going to be the number plus the value to the right of it. So nums at index plus one. And also we want to replace the index not with just this. Remember what we popped from the heap was num and the index. We're replacing it with a number plus the value to the right of it and index plus one. And so this is going to be pushed to the heap. Now, you might see an issue 
with this right here. Can you think of an edge case where this might mess up? Pay attention to this line over here. What if index plus one is out of bounds? It could happen. We might have reached a subarray sum that ends at the end of nums. So make sure to wrap this with this. Index plus one should be in bounds, therefore it should be less than n. So make sure you have that. And then we are pretty much done. Let me run this. And you can see it is, I guess, about as efficient. In the worst case, I guess we didn't analyze the time complexity, but the memory complexity is slightly improved. But in the worst case, the reason it's still going to be n squared log n is because right could be like the last index in n squared. That's like the largest it could possibly be. And so therefore this loop would iterate n squared times. Inside of the loop, we are pushing and popping from a heap, which is a log n operation because the heap is never going to be larger than n. So that's where I'm getting the time complexity of this from. Now, I guess I will mention that there is a third approach. And quite frankly, if you're just preparing for coding interviews, which I assume most of you guys are, I just don't think that this is worth your time. It's going to take you several hours probably to understand, even if I were to explain it. And the odds of you getting asked this in an interview, even if you were to watch my explanation and understand it, even if you got this in an interview, then you might still fail it. So I think if you have a limited amount of time, and you're not trying to be like a competitive programmer, I wouldn't bother with this solution personally. But if you want to, you'll have to make do with this uh, editorial, which I guess isn't horrible, but it's probably going to take you a while to understand it, to be honest.